Hello and welcome to another conversation with, uh, with the Middle East Monitor, a weekly show that brings to you news and analysis of pressing issues in the Middle East, as well as book reviews and uh, commentaries. Today, my host is Dr. Anne Irfan. Anne is a lecturer in interdisciplinary race, gender and post-colonial studies at the University College London. She's a historian who works, whose work examines the lasting impact of colonialism and modern displacements. Our focus today, however, is going to be Anne's new book, Refugee and Resistance, Palestinians and the International Refugee System. Uh, it's available from Columbia University Press, so do have a look. Um, we'll be, I'll be asking Anne a number of questions on her book. Uh, so, Anne, thank you for joining us, and it's good to have you. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to be here. Um, let's begin with um, general background about yourself and what sparked your interest uh, in Palestinian refugees. Sure. So I first visited Palestine, specifically the West Bank, in 2008, and my visit was probably a little bit of a cliche. I was uh, a student at the time. I went there in the summer on a volunteering project, teaching English in one of the refugee camps. So from the very beginning, my, my time in Palestine was very entwined with, with the refugee situation and the refugee camp specifically. And when I was there, I was really struck by a few things in particular. I mean, obviously, I think anyone who goes to Palestine finds it a very, um, a very arresting experience. But um, a few things stood out for me um, in a more kind of academic sense. One was I was really struck by how the camps operated as, as these particular spaces within the West Bank. And in connection to that, I was also really struck by the visibility of the UN in general, and in particular, the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, which is better known by its acronym of UNRWA or UNRWA. And I, saw, I noticed how these things were sort of connected, that the camps as spaces and the role and the presence and the visibility of UNRWA. And then it, was, it also really struck me that in so many of my conversations with Palestinians, even you know, quite young kids who I was teaching, there was this real awareness of the UN, of international law, of UN resolutions and conversations about Palestinian experiences and Palestinian rights were really peppered with all of these references to the UN. So I kind of came away with, with all of those observations and all of those thoughts. And then if I sort of fast forward a few years, I when I was actually starting during my master's degree and certainly during my PhD, when I was studying Palestinian history kind of more formally, it really struck me that the UN and UNRWA were really absent from a lot of the scholarship, certainly a lot of the historical political scholarship. So that was sort of how I really came to this topic. It was a combination of what I observed in the academy and what I observed on the ground in Palestine. And it was then fueled, obviously, by what happened you know, while I was doing this research with the Trump administration defunding UNRWA and, and Palestinian refugees who who've always seen their rights sort of kicked around as a political football, but really, really saw their uh, cause and their plight really being exploited and coming to the center. And so much misinformation was being circulated about both UNRWA and Palestinian refugees after the Trump defunding, that that also sort of seemed to further give impetus to, to the Brook Project. Yeah. And so, I mean, you Palestinian refugees are not in one place, of course. They're, they're scattered all over the Middle East and uh, other parts of the world as well. So what are the challenges that comes with um, researching Palestinian refugees? I mean, I know you were stopped and stopped at the Alambri Bridge, uh, denied entry, as is the case uh, on so many occasions. It denied entry into the occupied Palestinian territories. And um, we also know Palestinians move from endless cycles of expulsion and violence from more recently in Syria. The whole region has been in um, in constant war for a while. So what were the challenges you faced in, um, in, in conducting your research? Yeah, this is a really important uh, question, I think. The, the challenges for researching, well, anything around Palestine, but certainly around Palestinian refugees are multifaceted. They're political, practical, epistemological, you kind of hit challenges on every front. Um, as you say, Palestinian refugees are very widely dispersed, and that reflects the nature 
of the situation in Palestine itself. So I think the first practical challenge is that there's no kind of central body or no central location you go to. I'm a historian by training and by background. So, you know, my first kind of recourse is to go to an archive, but there's no, there's no central archive the archives are very kind of the archival collections that are of interest or of relevance are very fragmented they're very dispersed and they're not even necessarily accessible so i'm working particularly on palestinians who receive services from unra and that that means i'm concerned with palestinians in five or four or five regions so syria lebanon jordan and then the occupied palestinian territories occupied palestine so gaza, gaza and the west bank as you say there are many other Palestinians who don't live in those places, but that's kind of the, the remit of, of where I'm working. And that even that alone <laughs> gives you a huge number of challenges. You mentioned in 2014, I was denied entry um, by Israeli authorities at the Allenby Bridge crossings, where I was um, trying to cross from Jordan into the West Bank. And I was detained, as is unfortunately quite a common experience for many people and, and certainly for many uh, Palestinians far beyond what I experienced. And I was denied entry and I was told that applied for five years, which was pretty much the entirety of this research project. Um, so that meant I was unable to visit either archival collections or to just do any other kind of research in, in Palestine. Or also, you know, there are many sources in Israeli archives that would, I think, this my project would have benefited from me being able to take a look at. Um, part of the nature of the establishment of Israel was not only the takeover of land, but it was also the takeover of all kinds of documentary assets, which ended up in Israeli archives, which I wasn't able to access. So then if we look at the three remaining fields, that's Lebanon, Syria and Jordan, for very obvious reasons, Syria was out of the question. So most of my research ended up focusing on Lebanon and Jordan. And fortuitously, there are a lot of archival collections relevant to this subject in both of them. And in particular, UNRWA's main archive is located in Amman in Jordan. So practically, there was a lot I was still able to do. But nevertheless, there are all kinds of remaining challenges, not least the fact that archival collections tend to, by their very nature, and especially if they are institutional collections, tend to reflect the voices and experiences of power holders. And the average Palestinian refugee living in a camp is not someone who holds a great deal of power. So turning our attention to the book itself. Um, just provide us with a brief outline of the book. Um, what are the key questions you're trying to answer in your book? And uh, let's proceed from there. Sure. So the book is broadly speaking a political history of Palestinian refugees and refugee camps in the later decades of the 20th century. So it starts from 1948, the Nakba, the dispossession of the Palestinian people, the displacement of at least 750,000 Palestinians. And it traces their exile and their politics really from the Nakba up until roughly 1982. So, and I chose that period because that's really the heyday of Palestinian politics in the camps. And in 1982, as, as many people watching this and listening to this will know, uh, 1982 sees the PLO routed from what had been their base in Lebanon. And there and after the camps kind of lose what had been a lot of their prominence, at least certainly the, the camps that are outside historic Palestine. So within that period, very broadly, 40, 1948 to 1982, what I look at is how Palestinian refugees sought to articulate, express, struggle for their political rights, and particularly how they did so through engagement with the international system. And that's really where UNRWA comes into the analysis, because we had quite a distinctive setup here, whereby you have a particular national group living in camps, displaced and receiving services from what is, quote unquote, an international organization, which belongs to the very same organization that had facilitated the original partition of Palestine. So what I'm interested in in the book is how Palestinians drew on the UNRWA regime as a means to try and articulate their rights. And in particular, how they consistently really challenged the way in which their refugee identity was constructed, because under the UNRWA regime, Palestinian refugees were constructed as people who had socioeconomic needs and who were essentially aid recipients. But Palestinian refugees themselves, in common with many other refugees, saw their refugee identity as political, not as one related to aid or socioeconomic need. And they so they were constantly pushing against this construction of themselves, and they wanted their identity to be defined in political terms, and they wanted UNRWA to be struggling and pushing for their political rights and not only their socioeconomic needs. And very broadly speaking, I'd say the book is really the story of that struggle. Mm 
Mm. And you bring out the tension really well in the book, especially the tension between UNRWA and the Palestinians. At the beginning, UNRWA was being asked to resettle Palestinians in the host country and Palestinians resisting that. Uh, and um, and I think the, the quote that sums up the tension, I want, I want to read this out to you and then get you to comment on this. Um, so UNRWA walks a tightrope between the aspirations of the Palestinians and the stance of the host government and Arab contributors on the one hand, and on the other, the requirements which its major contributors, US, UK, and many other European countries, wish to see satisfied and on which their support is so is to some degree dependent. On occasions, the two are compatible. More often than not, they are not compatible. So speak, speak about that tension between, on the one hand, UNRWA being asked by its donors to, you know, um, to, to, to uh, re replace Palestinians, not replace, uh, put Palestinians in their host countries, and Palestinians resisting that. Uh, so that tension really comes out. So can you just comment on that quotation, please? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's there's a few elements of tension in that quote. So what that, that line really refers to is all of the different stakeholders who were involved in the UNRWA regime. And when I say stakeholder, I'm not using it in a financial sense necessarily, but people who mm. have some kind of engagement or investment in it. So we have, in terms of those stakeholders, obviously Palestinian refugees themselves, we have the donor states who are predominantly Western, particularly the US and the UK. We have the Arab host states, so Syria, Lord, uh, Syria, Lebanon and Jordan, and then also Egypt and Gaza until 1967. And then from 1967, Israel is not a host state, but it's the occupying power in the West Bank and Gaza. So UNRWA also has to negotiate with Israel. And all of those parties have different interests and they conceive of UNRWA's role in different ways. So the first tension we see, which you just alluded to, is that in the very beginning, the donor states dominated by the UK and the US really saw UNRWA, although they never said so, as a, a political, as, as an entity to serve their political interests. Um, for one thing, in the context of the late 1940s and the early 1950s, the US in particular was very concerned about communism. And there was a concern that hundreds of thousands of impoverished Palestinian refugees might, you know, quote unquote, fall prey to communism. And so in that sense, funding UNRWA very much was sort of aligned with the rationale behind martial aid as well. And then they also was there also was this feeling that these the quote unquote solution to um, the refugee crisis was, as you alluded to, to resettle the Palestinians permanently in the Arab host states. And this really went hand in hand with something that was a very prominent theme in the discourse for a long time, which was the denial of Palestinian national identity, because there was this feeling that, well, they're Arabs and they're living in Arab host states, so they're all Arabs, so they can just be resettled forever in the Arab host states. And it's striking if you look at the relevant documents from this period, it's very rare to see Palestinians referred to as Palestinians. They're usually referred to as Arabs, Arab refugees, or maybe Arab refugees from Palestine. So that's another element that, that the refugees were pushing against as well, the, the assertion of their national identity as Palestinians. With this in mind, the US and the UK early on um, had in mind that UNRWA would work predominantly as a jobs creation scheme. They wanted UNRWA to help Palestinians find permanent gainful employment in the Arab host states. And the idea being that they would then long term settle and prosper in the host states. And that would both remove the risk of communism and, again, sort of, quote unquote, resolve the issue. But Palestinian refugees themselves uh, were not willing to play ball with this, to put it simply. They um, were very focused on the right of return. They were conscious that the UN had actually recognized their right of return very soon after their dispersal. And they did not wish to be permanently resettled outside of their homeland. Keep in mind that some refugees had only just gone across the new borders and they could maybe even still see their lands or their houses or their villages. Uh, and for the in the early years, many of them actually crossed kind of secretly or furtively back to try and visit their homes or their land or their villages. And mm. so the jobs creation schemes were essentially a little bit of a flop. Very few Palestinians signed up for them. They instead campaigned for UNRWA to turn its focus to education, which UNRWA ended up doing. And it sort of became an, an early emblem, both of this tension, but also the fact that 
even though financially the power lay with the Western donor states, UNRWA was not going to be able to do anything without, without the consent of the Palestinian refugees themselves, and that it really needed them to be on board as well in order to have success with its work. And that became a really early lesson that, that came up time and time again over the decades. Yeah, and all that is happening, of course, within the context of um, the post-Second World War. That's important because um, you mentioned in your book as well that there that, that, that emerged a, a, a normative uh, international refugee regime that was created uh, in the aftermath. Uh, the category of refugee itself, how to deal with refugees, what their rights are, was all enshrined in various uh, international uh, documents. Um, despite that, you know, over the years, we, you know, there's emerged what we, you know, people as know as the protection gap for Palestinian refugees. Um, what has that meant for Palestinian refugees specifically, the protection gap which they uh, experience, and uh, what has that done for Palestinians in terms of in terms of their ability to secure their rights? Um, just ex expand on that for us. Yeah, let me do my best to explain the protection gap because I don't think this gives itself to very it gives itself easily to very smooth explanation. But to, but to put it very simply, we have a setup, uh, and we've had a setup for several decades now, whereby Palestinians receive services from UNRWA, and pretty much every other refugee group in the world receives services from UNHCR. That's been the case since 1967. And that is sometimes cited by anti-Palestinian voices as evidence that Palestinians have this unfair advantage because they have their own agency. Now, in reality, there's a strong argument for saying that this actually disadvantages the Palestinians because UNRWA has a much narrower mandate than UNHCR. And this is where the protection gap emerges. So to put it simply, UNHCR is mandated to provide protection for all of the Palestinian, or sorry, for all of the refugees who it serves. And UNHCR is also mandated to pursue political solutions for the refugee crises that it's involved with. UNRWA is not mandated to do either of those things. UNRWA is mandated only to provide services. Now, this means that the Palestinians are the only refugee group in the world who do not receive protection from any kind of international UN body. In theory, the reason why UNRWA does not have that mandate is because it was given to yet another UN body, which is known as UNCCP, which was originally mandated to pursue political solutions to the Palestinian refugee plight. But that has been defunct really since the 1950s. It technically still exists, but it is completely inactive. So we end up with what, uh, what scholars like Susan Akram call the protection gap, whereby Palestinians kind of fall through, fall through this gap. Of the, of the contrast between the two agencies, and that puts them at a disadvantage. And that also speaks to this, this bigger theme that, that we've already talked about, whereby Palestinians have been continually kind of pushing against UNRWA's very restrictive construction of their refugee identity as only being one of socioeconomic need. And they've been saying they want, uh, they want redress for their political rights as well. And they want things like protection because they are living in a situation of chronic structural vulnerability. Now, I think that that also speaks to a, a wider issue when it comes to the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, which is the fact that for whatever reason, uh, we can cite many reasons, um, the, the, the issue is divorced from international law itself, uh, whether it be refugees, right of return, whether it be uh, settlements, uh, whether it be where the borders should be, uh, the issue about the wall, uh, um, extracting water from Palestinian territory, uh, demolition of homes. I think all, the, all those issues which I've, which I've just mentioned are, uh, we know where they stand in terms of international law. The, the legal regime uh, prohibits, prescribes those uh, acts, but, for, but Israel, of course, refuses to accept that. And as is the case with the refugees, all those other issues are somehow divorced from the normative legal structure that appeared uh, after the Second World War. And, and a re refugee is just another example of that. Um, uh, let's turn our attention to um, organized resistance in the refugee camps itself. And that, that's a really important issue which you uh, uncover in your book. Um, when and why did that shift happen? 
uh, from uh, where the refugee camps were really influenced by the Nakba generation, uh, which was then overtaken by a, a revolutionary generation, a generation who was seeking uh, not just to accept their you know, fate, but really to organize and resist Israeli occupation, whether it be from Jordan, whether it be from Lebanon, and whatever they may be. So when and why did that shift take place within the refugee camps? I think there's a bigger point to be made here, whereby I would say that, you know, speaking again as a as someone from a back from an academic background as a historian, I think we as historians have been quite slow to latch on to the the impact of generational dynamics in driving events. And certainly if you look at how historians have engaged with things like maybe race and class and gender, the generational factor hasn't hasn't really get, gained the, the prominence I think it should in some analyses. But in the Palestinian case, it's, it's really clear what its significance is. Um, and to explain this, I obviously sort of have to speak a little bit in generalizations. So I'll caveat it by saying, you know, I'm conscious these are generalizations and obviously there are exceptions. But um, you've talked there, broadly about kind of two generations. So, so the Nakba generation were those who essentially, you know, were forced to leave or were displaced in 1948, at least as adults. And then those who either experienced the Nakba as children or who were born after the Nakba in camps. And that, that younger generation who either were born in exile or who were really too young at the time of the Nakba to have any decision-making power at all in where they went and what happened, they were really influenced and really shaped by their experiences of growing up in these camps of, of continual disempowerment really from birth. They hadn't experienced any of the hope or optimism that the older generation had experienced prior, you know, in Palestine, whereby they thought they, they may succeed in getting their own state and getting independence. The younger generation didn't have any of that. They only really felt this constant disempowerment. And they then also felt the marginalization that was often uh, that was often extended to them by the Arab host states. And this culminated in kind of the great disappointment of the Naxa in 1967, which really drove uh, many of the younger generation to decide to go their own way and to essentially operate independently and to also operate in a very Palestinian centric fashion rather than looking at the movement in connection to pan-Arab trends. Um, and this was um, quite a noticeable departure from from earlier drives that had that had placed Palestine much more closely in connection with with wider dynamics in the Arab world. I think one other thing that it's worth emphasizing here is that uh, something come, that comes up a lot if you read kind of testimonies and memoirs from this period is that many of the the Nakba generation were also really um, influenced by what happened in, in the 1930s. So 1936 to 1939, we had the Great Palestine Arab Revolt, um, where Palestinians tried to uh, force out the British, tried to take control and, and exercise their national self-determination and gain independence. And this revolt was really, really brutally suppressed by the British. Huge numbers of leading Palestinian nationalists were either executed or imprisoned or exiled. Um, and it was really devastating for the Palestinian nationalist movement. The historian Rashid Khalidi actually argues that, that the Palestinians lost not in 1948, but in, but in the 30s, mm. because it, the impact was so devastating. Mm. So it's also important to keep in mind that the older generation often had that in their memories. And that was something mm. that really sort of put them off uh, the idea of, of launching kind of mass insurrection. I mean, um, the Palestinian refugee for West Turkey, who was, I think, a very young child at the time of the Nakba, grew up in a camp in Lebanon. He's written several memoirs and he talks in his memoirs about, you know, his mother kind of admonishing him when he wanted to become politically active and, and, and being, being fearful of what might happen to him and what might happen to others in the family if they came politically, if they became politically active because of the precedent and the memory of what had happened, had, what had happened in the 30s. Hmm. And, and the pivotal moment um, which you speak about in the transition to uh, the revolutionary generation is, is the um, is uh, the Battle of um, uh, Karama in Jordan, 1968. Um, so what what did that do to the prestige of the Fadayeen Palestinian freedom fighters, and what subsequent you know effects did that have on the refugee camps and their dynamics with uh, Arab nations and Arab countries? So 
I think it's important to put this battle slightly in context that it comes after the 1967 defeat. So there's already been this really seismic loss for the Arab states who up until then had claimed that they were going to bring about the right of return and that they were going to defeat Israel. And so already many Palestinian refugees were starting to lose faith in that and, and, were, and were, were looking to more kind of Palestinian focused um, activism. And there had been small scale uh, Palestinian militants operating even long before 1967. These militants were known as Fida'in, as you said. And then in 1968, we have the Battle of Karama, which takes place in Jordan, and it, it occurs between the Israeli army, the Jordanian army, and Fatah, which is one of these early groups of Fida'in, uh, the most prominent one led by Yasser Arafat, who, of course, went on to become probably the most famous Palestinian of the 20th century. And what's interesting about the Battle of Karama is it's, it's a fairly kind of low scale victory. It, it's not this kind of massive... Um, massive military success but because by that point the, the palestinians and actually arabs in general have just had continual defeat at the hands of israel any success has a huge psychological impact on everyone and the fact that they are able um, to inflict damages on the israeli army which had by that point started to almost be seen as invincible has a huge morale boost gives a huge morale boost to palestinians um, across the region especially those in refugee camps who are the ones who've suffered the most and it also leads them to increasingly look towards the Fida'in as possibly the ones who are going to reverse their fate and improve the situation. And it's after the Battle of Karama that Arafat in particular really starts to take on this prominence and that you people report they start seeing pictures of Arafat being displayed in the camps. Whereas up until then, um, the figure who, who was most sort of visible was uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, the Egyptian president and the, the real kind of pan-Arab leader. So it, it sees a shift on numerous fronts in terms of Palestinian politics. And it's really the moment where many, uh, many Palestinian refugees decide they need to take matters into their own hands. And almost overnight, there's a huge rush of, of young Palestinians from the camps joining the Fida'in. Mm. So uh, let's talk about another transition. So most of what we're discussing is a transition to the revolutionary Palestinians in camps outside of history, Palestine, in mm -hmm. Jordan, in in, Le in Lebanon and elsewhere. So at what point did the transition then take place to Palestinian refugees in Gaza, for example? When What was the key moment which uh, made them rise up and resist Israeli occupation in, in, the, in the way they did, say, in the first intifada? Is it... It's important to keep in mind that Gaza has its own um, quite particular history when it comes to resistance against um, Israel. And I'm saying particular because that means it doesn't necessarily coincide with this other trends I'm talking about, but that also doesn't mean that nothing's happening there. So where Gaza is really distinctive is that of the, of the five fields where I mentioned, Gaza is the only one where refugees are the majority. So at least 70% of the Gaza population are Nakba refugees. It's it's really sees its demographics and its population transformed by the Nakba. And from pretty much the beginning, that gives Gaza this particular edge and this particular actual reputation as being kind of more radical and more hardline because it's known that refugees, as the people who've lost the most, who have the most to gain, who have the least to lose, are going to be more likely to get involved in, in armed struggle. So that's that's the case at the beginning with, from the beginning with Gaza, and and actually Israel and the Arab states are very aware of it. But the other thing to keep in mind with Gaza is that um, it first experiences Israeli occupation not in 1967 but in 1956. There's this short-lived Israeli occupation of Gaza in 56 um, as part of the or in connection to the tripartite aggression related to to Suez and Sinai, um, and that's kind of the first wave of Gaza. Gazan resistance directly against Israeli occupation. And that, and that in many ways um, is something that kind of sets the tone for it. And then when we see what's sometimes referred to as the Thauda in, in the camps outside historic Palestine, starting in the late 60s and going across the long 1970s, you also have phenomenons of the phenomenon of Palestinian militants and Fida'id in Gaza trying to link up with it. 
There's even cases of some of them trying to travel to camps in Lebanon and join it. So there's there's all of this quite long term kind of background of it. But there is also a feeling among some Palestinians in historic Palestine that they're sort of getting left behind because they're really cut off in many ways from Palestinians elsewhere. And for a long time, the movement is based elsewhere. And it's, as you mentioned, it's really in the 80s that this shifts quite definitively because the PLO is routed from Lebanon. It's already been routed from Jordan. It ends up in Tunisia, really far away. And the impetus starts to kind of move back to historic Palestine. And this really comes to a head in December 1987 with the outbreak of the First Intifada. But what is significant is that the First Intifada begins again in a refugee camp. And it's a group of refugees in Jebelia camp who react to, um, to the killing of some Palestinian workers by an Israeli truck driver that month. And that starts up the Intifada. So there's both a distinctive trajectory and there are these common themes that you see across across all the five fields, including Gaza. Yeah. So uh, we are running out of time. So I want to I end with uh, just a quick discussion on um, just dispelling some of the myths uh, on about Palestinian refugees. Uh, the issue of refugees um, recently became headline news following the Israeli a military onslaught in Jenin, which left a number of Palestinians dead. So that sparked a whole discussion on social media uh, about Palestinian refugees. In Israel, of course, will say well, Palestinian refugees are exceptional in the sense that they're the only descent, only refugee community where the refugee itself passes down from generation to generation. Uh, in order to undermine the fact that there are six million or so Palestinian refugees in the world. Um, is that really true? I mean, is it the case that the Palestinians are the only refugee community whose refugee status gets passed down from generation to generation? No, is the short answer. That is a very pervasive myth that we see propagated pretty regularly, and, and it flares up certainly in uh, when there's events in the news, like the, the invasion of Janine recently. But actually, the majority of refugee cases around the world are protracted, which, you know, means means they're long lasting. And it is standard policy, not unique to UNRWA, also policy of UNHCR, that those born in exile, say born in a refugee camp, will also be registered as refugees and eligible to receive services. What is the alternative? You're going to have, say, a Syrian refugee baby born in a camp who can't receive services because they they were born in the camp that that doesn't really make sense and what's more it's not even unique to have a refugee crisis go on for decades it's true that the Palestinian refugee crisis is the longest and it is particularly long but you can find other cases where we're on to multiple generations of refugees you can look at refugees from Burundi and Tanzania where there's um, more than 50 years of an ongoing refugee crisis that's also intergenerational. You can look at Afghan refugees in Pakistan and Iran. You can find cases of Vietnamese refugees. It's it's certainly not something that is unique to Palestinians. And the other one, I mean, it's an interesting one. I, I spoke with Avi Shlaim um, a few weeks ago. Um, I had a podcast with him. And... Um, we spoke about Iraqi refugees, Iraqi Jews who fled um, the country and resettled in Israel. Uh, there's, of course, lots of myths around that. And uh, Israelis regularly use the plight of um, Jewish Arab Jews, for example, to argue that, uh, that somehow we can offset the plight of Arab Jews who fled and resettled in Israel with the plight of Palestinian refugees who fled what was historic Palestine, what is now Israel, to the various other Arab countries. I mean, what, what do you make of that? I mean, for me, it seems like just another way of trying to uh, whitewash and nullify the fact that Palestinian refugees have rights in international law, have rights to return to their homes and territory, uh, be compensated for the fact that they've lost their you know, homes and territory. And, and really, there is legally there is no argument to offset one group of refugee with another group of refugee because human rights by their nature are not fungible goods which you can just you know exchange uh one with the other I mean, what's your thoughts on that 
Well, I think it does a disservice to all of the groups of refugees involved. And one thing that strikes me about it is that what it really does is, is not only the proposal is not only offsetting the experiences of one group of refugees against another, but it's also really offsetting the losses of refugees against the state. I mean, if you are, say, an Iraqi Jewish refugee living in Israel and you lost everything you had in, say, 1950, would you consider it ample compensation to be told, oh, but there was also a Palestinian man who lost everything, so therefore you, your, your losses are immaterial and don't matter? The fact that there were more than one group of refugees doesn't offset the loss for the people who experienced it. It instead, it's really a very state-centric approach where the state is arguing, essentially, we created some refugees, but we absorbed some other refugees, and therefore it all cancels out. But that's largely irrelevant to the people who experienced the displacement. The other thing I would add, in, and this, this connects to something I said earlier, is I think there is an, an underlying um, sort of ethno-national element to it as well, of, of almost seeing Arabs as all the same and, and just saying, well, well, they were displaced kind of in all directions and therefore it doesn't really matter. Um, which is not only, um, you know, offensive on multiple levels, but it's also completely at odds with generally how we think about this issue. If you look at something like the Second World War, which was obviously on a much bigger scale, or the First World War, on a, again, on a much bigger scale, where you had lots and lots of refugees from different nationalities displaced all across Europe in different directions, um, the view at the end of it was about looking into the experiences of those people, not about kind of saying, well, let's just offset all of them against against everyone. So it's it's really a politically motivated line. Um, and it it also tends to rely on lumping together all Jews from all Arab countries and disregarding the variation in their histories and their experiences. I completely agree. Uh, thanks for that. I mean, um, we are at the end of our time. Uh, what's next in terms of your project? I mean, do you have any more projects lined up, books lined up to do with Palestine, Palestinian refugees? Yeah, what I'm really interested in in doing is is placing Palestinian refugee history within the, the bigger history of displacement in the global south in this period. So what I'm looking at at the moment in the early stages is um, comparing early responses to the Nakba and the partition of India. It's two major refugee crises in the same period, both connected to British withdrawal, both connected to new borders, and then using that as a building block for looking for a larger project, project looking at the refugee regime in the global south and, and how Palestinians were part of this um, much bigger system in that period. It sounds fascinating. I really look forward to reading your you know, work on that. So thank you, Anne, for you. joining us. And thanks to all our viewers who have tuned in. And hope to see you again for another conversation with the Middle East Monitor. Bye-bye.